morning and welcome to Element. My name is Sarah and I am so happy that you're here with us this morning. If you are brand new to our live stream, a very special welcome to you and thank you for tuning in. I imagine it would be really difficult and challenging to try and connect with a new church community when everything is done virtually. So kudos to you for trying something new. Uh, in just a few minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we can better connect with you if you are new or if you're someone who just feels unconnected. But before we get into that, uh, we like to take a chance to sit and remind everybody here at Element what we're truly about. And his name is Jesus. Our aim is always to glorify God by teaching and living out the scriptures, transforming community into gospel community and planting churches. So how are we staying connected in this time of social distance and all things virtual? Every single week, we actually have a welcome team who is ready to greet you, answer your questions, even pray with you. They are available through Zoom for 15 minutes after each service. At the end of the service, you'll see a link pop up. You can jump on Zoom. Don't worry about how you look or you don't even have to turn your video on. You can just get on and say hello. Maybe you're not Zoom ready um, and you would rather send an email. You can always email us at connect at ourelement.org and we'd love to get in touch with you that way. And we're also on social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. So hopefully you'll know how you can plug in with us and let us know that you are here. Maybe you are uh, at that stage where you've been watching virtually and you are ready to gather in a safe manner. We do have something for that as well. Every single Sunday, there has been a group of us who are meeting uh, at 9 a.m. outside of the church. So we are socially distanced, we are safe, we are staying outside. You might have to start dressing a little warmer or be bringing a blanket with you, but Aaron has been giving the full message outside. There's no music or announcements, but he does offer uh, a section for questions and answers, and that community has really been uh, growing together and learning together. It's really neat to watch happen. So you're also invited to that. The last thing that I have for you is um, to tell you about our upcoming online course uh, beginning Tuesday, November 10th. This is the next part of our Element University series, and it's going to build off of what we learned in the spring, which was our foundation. It's also going to be a practical application to what we've been learning through Acts and living on mission for Christ. Christians are called to live with, love, and build up each other but we're also called to be God's ambassadors to the world around us. God's call to engage the world stops us from living as if the church is a bomb shelter from the rest of the world. What does this mean? It means, yes, we wanna be here to hold you, lift you up, teach you, equip you, but we also wanna send you out. How do we be God's ambassadors? What does that mean? And how do we do that better? Hopefully, through the five weeks of Element University, we will be able to explain that more. The way it's going to look is a little different since it is an online course. We're encouraging you to watch every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. from a computer because we will have a live chat where you can submit questions and get answers right on the spot. If you can't tune in then, don't worry. You, it'll be up all week long and you can catch up whenever's available for you but just know that the, each new week's lesson will be released Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. and there will be a live chat that goes along with it. So that's all the things I have for you this morning. Thanks again for tuning in. Talk to you soon. Hey, good morning, Elements. We hope you guys are having a great Sunday morning so far. Welcome to November. We've survived so far 10 whole months of 2020. And this month, if you're wondering what's going to be emerging out of its cave, its name is Michael Buble. He's going to be coming out to serenade us with Christmas songs starting this month. Are you happy about that? Whether you are or you're not, we're going to sing some non-Michael Buble songs right now. We have raised a thousand voices just to lift your holy name we will raise thousands more to sing of your beauty in this place well none can even fathom 
No, not one to find your worth As we marvel in your presence To the ends of the earth We give you glory Lifting up our hands singing holy You alone are worthy We just want to touch your heart Lord, touch your heart So welcome to Elements live stream today, whenever or wherever you're watching from. And this is actually election week for us. And I would encourage you to go out and vote. I, my whole thing is we have a great privilege in our country to be able to be a people who vote. And if you don't vote, you don't get to complain. And that's like Americans' second favorite pastime is just complaining about everything. So if you don't vote, you don't get to complain. So go out and vote. There you go. That, that, that's what I got. Also, uh, someone sent me an email this week because what I said about Halloween, which was just Saturday. And they, they said, they asked me a question why I was saying that Halloween can be a great holiday for those in churches. And I don't mean to say all the weirdness and spookiness of Halloween is a good thing. What I, what I say in a normal non-COVID year is that people come to your house and they knock on your door and you get to open your door and talk to them and they're, you get to know your neighbors really well. And if you have kids, you get to go to your neighbor's houses and knock on their door and they're happy to see you and they give you candy. It's a, it's a really great way to get 
get to know those in your neighborhood. And that's the whole point behind Halloween and coming at it from a perspective of how we can be more missional in our mindset around it. So hopefully you were able to do a little bit of that over Halloween, uh, maybe not, but it is a good way to be able to connect with our neighbors and hopefully build a little bit more community while not focusing on the negative aspects of it. Now, as a reminder, in the middle of this message, there will be a slide that comes up, and on, when that slide goes up, you can go get coffee, take care of your kids, pause the live stream, journal down the answer to that question. It's there to give you a little break in the middle of the message if you need it. Now, if you have a smart device, you can download this app. It is called Uversion. Once you download it, it just says Bible. And when you open that up, if you're in our local area, you click on More and Events and we'll just come up. If you're not in our local area, type in the zip code 93455 and you'll get the sermon notes, the verses, the questions, the announcements, really everything that goes along with today's message. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. And if you are so inclined where you are, you can stand for the reading of God's word. And this is Acts 28 verses. 30 and 31. This is what it says. He, that is Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Let's pray. Uh, Father, this morning we ask that you would take us and teach us what we are to learn as we kind of close out this book of Acts. The places not just that you lead Paul, but you're leading us to as well and that we would trust you as you take us into those places that we may not understand, but you fully do. So have us be a people who learn to glorify you as we live out our lives that are ways that are your hands and feet in this world, uh, that we live sent on the mission that you have put us in. Amen. Amen. Well, technically, this is the last week of the book of Acts. I do have one more next week. I'm going to kind of round it all out, tell you some things that most likely happened to Paul that we don't know, but early church sources kind of tell us things that did. Now, it's interesting how a lot of commentators talk about the end of the book of Acts, why the book of Acts actually ends the way that it does, with Paul proclaiming without hindrance, though he is still in chains. Kind of seems like an oxymoron. But if you look through the book of Acts, where we've been, you see it's it's not because chains are no obstacle to what God is going to do in our lives. And Paul was able to preach the gospel where he is, all the things that God has done to rescue us. Now, again, Acts doesn't say what kind of happened to Paul at the end of his life. It's kind of like a, like a cliffhanger a little bit in like a TV show. What you have is in verse 16 of chapter 28, Paul arrives in Rome. And in verse 31, the book ends. And there's seriously just 16 verses of kind of what takes place when Paul Paul gets to Rome. There are literally in this uh, like 59 verses covering Paul's trip to get into Rome and then just those 16 verses when Paul gets to Rome. And 14 of those verses are taken up with Paul talking to the Jewish religious leaders when Paul calls himself the apostle to the Gentiles. So really, what's going on in all this? I'm glad you asked. We're going to talk about that today just a bit because there are questions that come. Did Paul have a fruitful ministry? Did he stand before Caesar? There are these questions. We'll answer some of those next week, but I want you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 first. Now we're going to deal with all the previews that I gave you again next week, but I think what you see is that God is more intent on the journey that he takes us on to grow us into who he is. And so as that journey goes on, we see that God grows us in the people we're meant to be. Even Christianity, when we believe, Christianity is not a destination. Christianity is like the beginning of the journey as we walk with God through things. And so we're going to look at Paul's life, how the book ends on the statement that it does, and Paul's understanding of the gospel throughout it, and then how we should live as well. Uh, Kent Hughes, when he relates the ending of the book of Acts, he does it with the gymnastic portion of the 1976 Olympics. Apparently in 1976, a Japanese athlete broke their leg during one of their routines, and everyone thought he was just finished. But on the last day of the competition, the one that's going to figure out if the championship goes to the Japanese or the Russians, this guy shows up again. He hops on the rings and does his ring routine. You know, the spinny things and up and over and iron cross. And at the end of it, he has to dismount. And he does one of those flippy turny things like 10 feet in the air, and he lands his dismount. He refused to quit no matter how bad the pain, and he got the best score he's ever gotten in his life. 
And Hughes relates this to Paul, that Paul used all of his limitations in his life to really stick the landing for his God. Nobody ever thought that a chained prisoner could reach the city of Rome with the gospel, and yet that's exactly what Paul does. So Philippians chapter 1, we looked at this last week. We're going to look at it again next week, but this was written while Paul was in chains, in jail, in Rome. Philippians 1 verses 12 through 14, Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I mean, think, think about that j- just for a moment. Paul was in jail. Each shift brings another Roman soldier to watch over him, to make sure he's not doing anything wrong. And so Paul has a captive audience. All the people who comes and talks to him, the Roman soldiers sit there for. As Paul is writing these letters that become the books of the New Testament, the Roman soldiers are overlooking that. And what you see is over the course of time, these very stoic praetorian guards begin to see the reality of Paul's life and how Jesus is with him in every moment. Now, we know that some guards actually followed Jesus because other soldiers began to mock them. Today in Rome, there's one of the earliest depictions of Jesus, and it is not flattering. It is cut from the walls of the barracks in the palace of the Caesar. And it is a scratched human figure with a donkey's head nailed to a cross, which is Jesus, and a man who is pictured kneeling before it. Now, here is a picture of it. And we'll show you another picture that also has in relief brought out what that looks like. Because it's only a scratching, but there's one picture, you'll see it, that's really dark and you see what's actually written there. And the artwork is an insult to a Roman soldier converting to Christianity. The inscription there on that says, Anexaminos, which means Alexander, worships his God. And what it tells you is that some of Rome's imperial elite came to trust Jesus with their lives. And you will see they even led some of their privileged friends to know Jesus. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, again, written in those two years Paul was in jail in Rome. Philippians 4.22 says, All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Caesar's own household. Now, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 28. Acts 28. Again, this is why the ending of Acts becomes so important as to what's happening. Acts 28, verses 30 and 31, Paul, again, or Luke says, again, He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. According to those last verses in Acts, Paul witnesses to everybody boldly without hindrance. And as an added bonus, while a prisoner, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, writes some New Testament books. Uh, Most likely the book of Philippians, Philemon, Ephesians, Colossians. Some believe 1 and 2 Timothy, but I believe those are actually written later, like 2 Timothy when Paul is re-arrested later. Uh, John Stott once wrote that these books are the most Christological, the most Christ-centric of all the books we have, of all of Paul's writings. That God did great things with Paul even while he was in chains, despite all those limitations that happened in Paul's life. Uh, Paul will write shortly before being martyred in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 10. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, in doing and reading everything I did for the book of Acts to take us through it, I listened to a lot of people, I read a lot of things, but for some reason, like other than Craig Keener's four-volume work on Acts, which is 4,500 pages, our series has been the longest that I've found. Now, J.D. Greer is someone who I appreciate a lot, and he will actually take the last three chapters of Acts and just kind of mush them all together. And as I was going through some of his stuff, there were five points that he had that I wanted to share with you, and I finally get to the place today where I get to to actually talk about those. And they are like five things that we can learn from Paul's life that apply to ours as well. Uh, If you're new here, you're going to get a little bit of uh, reflection on things that we've gone through, a little recap of where we've been so far. But certain things we learn from Paul's life in these chapters of Acts. I'm going to give you five of those. Number one is this. We are to be a people who live provocatively in the world. 
When people look at our lives, does it provoke a question in them of what kingdom we are living for, who we are? Like in Acts chapter 25, verse 22, King Agrippa uh, has heard so much about Paul that he wants to hear Paul speak for himself. Now, this whole thing comes about because Paul has been living on these missionary journeys in the world, sharing the gospel, and in Acts chapter 20, he leaves the Ephesian elders and goes into Jerusalem to observe Passover just like he had planned. When he gets there, the Jewish leaders rile up this mob to go and attack Paul and get him arrested. And then the Jewish leaders tell the Romans that Paul had come to start a political revolt. Now, that's a lie, but it sounds a lot like politicians today. Like, well, they'll take a, a candidate's position and one little thing that they said and twist it around to say whatever they want it to say. The, the Romans question Paul. They very quickly realize he's not there to start a political revolt at all. But the Jews want to kill him. So what do they do? Because he's a Roman citizen. So they send him to the regional governor, a guy named Felix. And Felix is going to leave Paul in prison for two years. But then it's not all bad news because many of the books in the New Testament were written while Paul was in prison in the area of Caesarea under Felix, including the book of Romans, which the moral of the story is, is if you're in jail or maybe stuck in COVID, start writing books. Who knows what's going to happen, right? Eventually, Felix is succeeded by a governor named Festus. Festus comes in. He's looking at all the mess that Felix has left behind. He's got to take care of. He talks to the Jewish religious leaders and finds out he's got this prisoner named Paul. So what do I do about this? So he brings Paul to stand in front of him, and he says, I'm just going to send you back to the Jewish religious leaders for that trial because it's not really a Roman matter. Paul knows that he's going to get killed if he goes to the Jewish leaders. So Paul says when he comes and stands before Festus, says, I appeal to Caesar. This is a legal precedent where you could appeal right to Caesar as a Roman citizen, but you had to abide by what Caesar said, no matter what Caesar said. And the Caesars were not the most stable people in the world. It's kind of weird how unstable people always seem to get into power. But the Caesar at the time in Rome, where Paul is, is a guy named Nero. Nero at this point has gone pretty nutty. He is like the prototype for every Marvel DC villain. We can call him Thanero. And if he got up on the wrong side of the bed and saw Paul was like, my Wheaties didn't taste great this morning, off with that guy's head, that is exactly what would happen. Now, before they ship Paul off to Caesar, though, Herod Agrippa, who is the Jewish royalty in the area, comes to visit Festus and says in Acts 25, 22, I hear you got Paul. I'd really like to hear him speak myself because Agrippa wants to know, why are all the Jews up in arms about this guy? What's really going on? People constantly wanted to know what made Paul tick. Paul's manner of life provoked a question just like ours should. Why do you live the way that you do? Why do you care when nobody else does? Why are you generous when nobody else is? Why do you put yourself in places and offer hope when nobody else does? Why are you so loving and patient and forgiving? In 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, Peter says this, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Now, make a defense, it's that word apology. It means to give an answer because people should be asking, why do you do what you do? Now, I know it's easier to say that than to tell you how to do it. So let me give you a couple ideas in this with this overarching theme of God's rescue and redemption from what Peter and Paul both write. And the first one is this, we live provocatively in how we work. Work is a huge part of our life. We will spend uh, upwards of 100,000 hours of our life at work. That means how we work should connect to how God rules over and has given us grace in our lives. Our work should be done with excellence and integrity, even when no one is looking. That people might say, oh my goodness, I can tell you work for a different boss than just money. Secondly, we should live provocatively in how we handle disappointment, persecution, and pain. I think pain and disappointment are some of the best places for us to put the gospel on display. I think almost anybody can be happy when things are going well. I know we all know those people who when things are going well, they're still down in the dumps like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. We we know those people. But for most of us, you know, we're pretty happy when things are going well. But how do we have joy when things aren't going well? When we sit in the middle of something like COVID and we still have hope. Well, when that we show a foundation to people who don't know Jesus that we have a great hope, that we have a foundation, that we have been rescued by God himself. It's a provocative way of living. And thirdly is we live provocatively in our generosity of spirit. 
God has given to us. We are a people who give to others as well. We look for a way to bless and help others. Um, this could be like, have you ever bought somebody groceries before or helped them fix their car and pay for the par parts or bought somebody else's meal in a restaurant who maybe you weren't even there with? You ever help somebody out and they offer to pay you back and you say, no, no, it, it wasn't a loan. And they can say, well, why? And you say, because God has been so gracious to me, I'm going to be generous as well. What we do with our money should provoke a question in a good way. Like my wife and I, uh, when we bought our first house, or sometimes when I don't have TurboTax do my taxes and I have someone do it, they, they always say, oh my goodness, uh, you give a lot of money away. If you didn't give this much money away, you could afford this house or do this or that. But if we didn't give our money away, we wouldn't be as generous as God calls us to be. I mean, do you know the average person in churches today gives about 2.4% of their income away? Americans who don't even believe in God give 2% of their income away. And so do you think 2.4% really provokes a question in those around us? Like most people assume that Christians are people who are just moderately more moral than other people, or at least they should be. They don't see them as people who live for an entirely different kingdom. And yet when people give 8, 10, 15% of their income away, it gets noticed, sometimes by the IRS. And like when I do do TurboTax, it comes back and it says, you might get audited for, for this. Do you have receipts? And I'm like, yes, I, I have receipts for this. Our generosity is supposed to beg that question because we live provocatively in the world. And the question is not, why are you just a little more moral than me? The question is, my goodness, you must live for an entirely different kingdom. And we do. We live in ways that glorify God because he has first rescued and been so generous with us. So we become generous as well. So right here, I'm going to ask you my question. This is where we're going to put up the slide. If you need to, you can take care of your kids, get a cup of coffee. You can even pause and journal this and ask it to other people who are sitting around you. But this is my question. When was the last time someone asked you about your life because of how you lived? When was the last time someone came along and said, oh my goodness, what is different about you? Maybe you were kind in one area. Maybe it is how you work. Maybe it's how you handle disappointment and, and pain. Or maybe it is your generosity of spirit. But when was the last time someone asked you about your life because you how you live differently because of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, moving on, the second thing, living provocatively, then we're going to get into places where, secondly, we seize opportunities. Open to Acts chapter 26. Uh, when Agrippa talks with Paul, Paul is going to seize that opportunity to go all out on his message to him. Acts 26, verses 27 to 29, Paul says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Now, Agrippa is Jewish royalty. He would have to say that he believed in the prophets. Agrippa would have been about eight years old when Jesus was crucified. And so Paul takes all the prophets that Agrippa says he believes in and connects them to Jesus. Do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. What does Agrippa do? And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. See, Paul's life here, it is on the line. And Paul is like, I have been giving an audience to proclaim Jesus to the royalty of the land. And so he goes for it. Is that how we see our professions in our lives? Like maybe God made you what you are. Maybe you're a doctor or a lawyer or a landscaper or an IT professional. Maybe it's not even a career you thought you were going into, but you found out you really, really like it. Do you use opportunities that maybe give you a platform there to share hope and the goodness of who God is? Maybe God made you a teacher for that reason. And I'm not talking about violating ethical norms or anything, but how do, you, how do we share with our peers? And this can go for athletes and students and children. Paul saw whatever situation he was in, including chains and jail, as a platform from which to proclaim Jesus. Thirdly, then, we embrace God's sovereignty as a gift because God is sovereign. He is over all. Put him now to Acts chapter 27. So when Paul is actually being sent to Rome, he's on this ship, you know, a couple months on that, but there's a couple week portion where it's just storms and waves and everybody's freaking out. In Acts 27 verses 22 through 25, Paul starts to share with the people on the ship who are afraid. And Paul says, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So Paul says to the people, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been 
told. See, because Paul lives provocatively and because he sees his opportunities and because he sees God's sovereignty as a gift, he is able in this circumstance to look at these people and say, God has said I'm going to Caesar and you guys are with me so you're safe. Paul doesn't let the circumstances of this storm make him, God, make him doubt God's ultimate control of the situation. What it did is Paul then sees this storm. He's like, okay, great. God's going to now use this storm. I'm going to step into it to talk about the goodness and hope of who God is in the midst of this. There are 276 people on this ship. Some are prisoners like Paul. Some are sailors. Some are soldiers. There might even be some other travelers. And in this moment, every single one of them are in the same boat, <laughs> so to speak. They are all have the same thing in common. They're terrified. They're all thinking they're about to die. And what does Paul do? He steps into the middle of that, and he speaks of the hope and the goodness of who God is. As a Christian, God does not shield us from the storms. He allows us to go through the same things everyone else goes through, so we can show what hope looks like in the midst of the storm. J.D. Greer says this, demonstrating the presence of God in the storm is more powerful than calling to them for people outside the storm. I've told you a few times about my friend Trevor during the book of Acts. Trevor died a few years ago from cancer. If you knew Trevor, Trevor is a knucklehead. He could be a pain in the rear end. He was arrogant and prideful, but Trevor really did love Jesus. And one of the things that Trevor said to me before he died was this. He said, I don't want to waste my cancer. He said, my body may experience pain. I may get scared, but my spirit is filled with hope because one day my God will wipe away every tear from my eyes. And Trevor is a brother. He is a son. He is a father. He was a husband. And I think it's from those places of the graveside of a husband, a father, a son, a, a sibling, or in the midst of your third year not being able to even get pregnant or your fourth miscarriage that we can better understand and say what the psalm writer says in Psalm 103, verses 2 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good. It is in the places where we've been treated long, wrongly, where we've been forgotten about, maybe where you're fired for doing the right thing, that we get to proclaim what is also spoken in the Psalms. Psalm 27 verse 10, my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Do not buy into the lie that you have to have a perfect life in order to proclaim and share the gospel. We can even share the gospel in the midst of our own fears and our own doubts. Our testimony to and about Jesus is so much more powerful when it comes from within the storm, from our place of weakness, not our place of strength. One writer says this, You are not put on the earth to demonstrate your awesomeness, but God's graciousness. And so I think when we live provocatively and when we seize those opportunities and embrace God's sovereignty, we're going to move into places where we begin to discover what our calling is. And that's number four, discover your calling. And this is kind of where Luke says in Acts 28, verse 14, and so we came to Rome, because that's the call that was put in Paul's heart. Now, obviously, we all have one calling, and that calling is to glorify who God is in our lives. But there are other callings as God takes and, and redefines that and makes you know, our course of our lives come more into focus of where we are going as a result of you know, seeking to glorify God. So Paul's focus is, you know, I've got to get to Rome. God has called me to go there now. That's what the Spirit of God put in his heart. And as Paul served, he experienced that narrowing of his focus. Actually, in Romans 15, Paul will call it his ambition. And I would want for all of you to discover God's calling for your life. You know, we're not responsible really for the whole mission because that, that's God's mission. But the Spirit of God calls each of us to different aspects of it. So the question then becomes, do we know ours? Because for you, it could be something God's laying on your heart. Is this, a, is this a place in the world? Is it an age group? Is it a particular ministry? Maybe it's a spiritual gift you're supposed to start using in the church or out in your neighborhood. Is there a part of the city that moves you? Maybe you want to help prisoners in jail or build houses with Habitat for Humanity. Calling is not just for professionals. It is for every single one of us. And Paul's calling will take him 2,997.4 miles from Jerusalem into Rome. And the last thing that we see is when we discover our calling, then fifthly, we are to be a people who live sent on mission. 
back to the verses that we started with. Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. This is how the book begins. This is how the book ends. Jesus sends us on mission. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Again, we don't know what happens when Paul stands before Caesar or his court. We don't know any of that. Acts doesn't tell us. Again, it's like a cliffhanger, the worst way to end your favorite TV show. I understand that, right? Especially if you don't know if it's been picked up or not. But we aren't told what happens to Paul and his dreams. And I think because in the end, it's not about Paul and his dreams. It's about God's spirit and the gospel. And this is Luke's way of saying, you can kill and imprison Paul. You can kill and imprison us. The entire world can be overtaken by a pandemic, but you can't stop the gospel. Because here we sit 2,000 years or so later, still being called by God to the same mission as Paul, to proclaim the gospel and to make it famous wherever we are. And so Greer kind of sums this up, and he says, so what we are to be is live sent in our volunteering meaning God has given so much to us. He has blessed us so much, so we bless those around us. So we volunteer and give of our lives no matter where we are. We give back because God has given so much to us and because he's blessed us, he's called us to be a blessing. Then we live sent in our generosity. And as we talked about before, it's not that God needs your money. I mean, God considers it all his (laughs) anyway. But generosity changes our hearts to be more and live more like Jesus. And then again, we're meant to have sent in our faith. We start to pray for those around us, to love those around us, especially that uh, presidential candidate that you don't like. Pray for them as well. We pray for those in our work. We pray for those in our neighborhood. Maybe people who would not even darken the doors of a church when COVID wasn't going on. We pray for them every day. If you're a parent, you pray for your children, that God will raise them up to be that next generation who takes the gospel forward. I call today's message, Wherever We Are. Because the book of Acts doesn't really end with Paul. I think it's still being written in and through us today. See, Jesus gets the gospel to Rome through Paul. How will the gospel get to our communities? That exact same spirit that's leading Paul is available and leading us. The gospel goes into new areas, first through regular people. Like uh, in, in Rome, you have those Jews who were booted out, and then they probably came to hear some of them, the gospel of Jesus Christ in other places, and then moved back in with their business into Rome. And other ones, because of the book of Romans itself, came to believe. And so Paul comes in. As he's there, he confirms, and it starts to multiply. In Jeremiah chapter 29, I've talked about this a few years ago, about what God tells his people to do when they're sent into places that are exile to them, how that they were supposed to bless the world no matter where they were. And what he tells them is a good reminder for us and where we are today. Jeremiah 24, God says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, that is the God who rules everything, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile. That's an important line. God says, I sent you where you are, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 5, he says, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Verse 6 says, take wives. That means you're kind, you ask, you propose, you don't bonk them on the head and haul them back to your cave. And have sons and daughters, meaning make babies. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare. And that's the Hebrew word for shalom, the peace of God. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. God says he is sending them where they are. That means God sends us where we are. Wherever we are, we are called by God to be a missionary there. If we claim the name of Jesus, we are missionaries. The great myth of missions is that it is people who we send overseas to all those places that we would never go and share the gospel there. And that is part of it. But being a missionary is also us sent to the cities in which we live. And if we're going to reach all the nations of the earth, we start where we are. And so God says to invest in your city. Invest in your city. Build houses, settle in, plant gardens. Yes, God does call some people to move on, especially those in the military who are here for a short time. But while you're here, you bless the city where you are. Others of us are going to probably live here our entire lives. But God is calling all of us to the city while we live here. 
And he points to how living on mission also includes the making of a family. And I think this is multiple ways. I think it's the family of God as believers coming together, and it's also making a literal family. You know, in, in America, the majority of Christians are women. Nothing against that. I, I am married to one, and I love her a lot. But those who tend not to care and listen are usually the men. Like, statistically, guys in their 20s are the least likely to attend a church as they run from family and maturity and responsibility. Uh, they are the ones who typically will fill up jails and use women, and their mommies look after them. If their mommies aren't around, then their girlfriends take care of them. Now, I'm not saying all guys in their 20s are like that. You may be a very godly guy in your 20. Yay, keep following Jesus. But being single can be a godly lifestyle. It doesn't have to be like that. I know some single people who understand more about family than a lot of married people do. What I am saying is as we invest in the city and we understand what family is supposed to be, we come alongside one another and build that up with one another as God calls us to because we will be a blessing where we are when we do that. And secondly, God says that we are to serve the common good. We do not do what is just good for us, but for everyone. Meaning if the schools are terrible, then Christians should go and volunteer. If kids are having a hard time, Christians should be tutoring. We're actually helping tutoring over at Delta High School. You know, what are the ways we can serve the well-being of the entire city? Because God says, pray for the welfare of the city. And God will not just change people's hearts around us, but he will also change ours as well. Because it's not just God changed the city. God says, that's why I sent you there, to be a blessing to that place where you are. Don't lose sight of what I'm calling you to. See, we are sent to seek the peace of God for the place in which we live. So we go out and do justice and live in kindness and walk humbly with God. We live sent on the mission that God has placed in us, in the places where we are to continue speaking of the hope and the good news of Jesus' rescue of us by our actions and our words wherever we are. We are to be a people who live provocatively, who seize the opportunities that God has placed in front of us to embrace God's sovereignty as a gift, to discover our calling and then live sent on mission wherever we are as a people. And we have to understand this all comes out of the understanding of God's great rescue of us first. Why do we live provocative and a little? Why don't, we, do we sh- why don't we shrink back and get afraid? Because God has first saved and loved us. God has extended himself to us in the person of Jesus. And so we can live provocatively in the world because we know that we belong to him. And nothing can snatch us out of his hand. So we trust him and his rescue and his grace spoken over us because God is so good to us. This is one of the reasons every week at Element we start after the message with this idea of what communion is supposed to be. And I know in your homes it's kind of hard to go and take communion. It's kind of awkward, you know, grape juice and crackers or bread or whatever it is. But it's a reminder of what Christ has done to rescue us. So we encourage you to, to figure that out every week where you are. That Christ's body was broken, represented by crackers or, or bread. It's, it's a metaphor to help us understand what he did. That his blood was shed for us as represented by, by grape juice or, or by wine. It's meant to be a reminder of the good news of the gospel that God has purchased us with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. To bring us into his family. And then not just bring us in, but also to send us back out again to be a people living sent on mission in the world wherever we are. And I would encourage you today to understand the, uh, God's gracious rescue of us, and that would then send you out to speak of the gospel in real and true ways. Because if you need prayer today, maybe you, you're in a spot where you're wondering how to live sent exactly where you are, especially in the midst of COVID and you like some prayer, well, you can send off the live stream. You can write a prayer request on the side. You can uh, send an email to prayer.element.org or connect.element.org, and we will get in touch with you if you'd like us to. We will, we will pray with you if you need us to. If you want someone to come over and socially distance pray with you, we will do that as well. We want to be a people who come together as a family, as God tells us to, to support and love and encourage one another to understand and encourage one another to understand that we have been called and sent into the world to be God's blessing to the world as we reflect the gracious salvation that we have received. We are a people who have been loved by God so much more than I think we could ever begin to understand. As I said during the message, we are a generous and giving people, and if you'd like to give, you can do that online. Uh, You can mail checks to us if, if you'd like, but Element is also a giving church. We give away as well. 
You know, we want to make sure that people around us are taken care of in ways that make sense. And so as you give, we give, and we are meant to be just generous people, and that's who we want to be because God has been generous with us. But it all comes back to our understanding of the gospel. And I would encourage you guys this week, you know, to maybe take some of the sermon notes questions that are, that are you can attach to the PDF, you can get the link tree that comes at the end of this, and maybe ask one another these questions about our lives being lived provocatively, about seeing ourselves in the cities where we are. Are we blessing our cities? Are we blessing those around us? Are we living as a response to what God has first done in us? Are we being this people? who are seizing the opportunities because of God's grace and sovereignty as we understand his mission, as we live sent on his mission in the world. Let's be those people that live like Paul did, even though he was in chains, out in the world bringing God glory and honor. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would take us and move us to a place where we would understand our great rescue that has first been done by you that you have blessed us and loved us and saved us and brought us in. And then we would be a people who begin to live provocatively in the world, that our lives would provoke responses from those around us, that they would say, what is different about you? Because we are seizing those opportunities to be able to live differently in the world in a way that lives in hope and grace and life that we would be those who understand your great sovereignty over us so we would understand our calling and live sent on the mission that you have placed us in. That we would do all that we do to bring you glory. And in that, that we would live in the joy that you provide. Teach us to be a people who worship you, but are also an outward looking people. That we would see those around us who need your hope and your grace and your life. And we would be those who extend that to others on your behalf as we speak of the great good news that we ourselves have received. Teach us to be your people in the world as we live and honor and glorify you. And we ask these things in your son's good name. Amen. Jesus, Lord of my salvation, Savior of my soul, Send me out to the world to make you known. Jesus, King of every nation, this world's only hope. Send me out to the world to make you known. Send me out to the world I want to be your hands and feet be your voice every time I speak want to run the ones in need in the name of Jesus want to give my life away for your kingdom's sake Shine a light in the darkest place In the name of Jesus In the name of Jesus i
Joy 
Jesus, thank you for this morning, and uh, Lord, we just pray that, um, Lord, that you would make us a, a, a spectacle in our community, in our, in our world that we live in, Lord. And Lord, that we would live just as we just sang, Lord, that how, who you love, I'll love. Who you serve, I'll serve. Lord, that we would be a beacon of hope and, and, and not be just like the rest of the world that seems so full of hate right now. Lord, that you would allow us to, Lord, give us the grace to love how you, who you've loved and to serve who you've served. Lord, going into an election week in this strange and tough time in our country and our lives, Lord, um, I pray that we would be a beacon of hope, Lord, that we would step out and be real and be raw and love those that are hard to love and serve those that are hard to serve. And um, Lord, we love you and we pray all this in your name. Amen. All right. Well, won't you guys stand with us for one more song? in the sound of thunder and rain you're arriving in the calm the wind and the waves you're arriving in a glow a burning flame burning flame praise awaits you at the dawn the world comes alive praise awaits you in the darkness shines in the light praise awaits you with the song of love and You guys have a great week. Jesus loves you.
watch dinosaurs after lunch. We got some kids boxes. We learned about a plain mantis. I seen people thing. And we looked at Halloween costumes. And now Kenneth is gonna go on a long bit. See you next time. Bye. Bye.